Hello, I'm Bob Wilson. I'm a former Commodore of the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club. This is an interview to try and throw some light on what I've been doing since I arrived in Hong Kong. Thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, Bob Wilson, Commodore, rowing captain, vice patron, and very much a figure of our club, and you've had such an impact over the last uh, 40, 50 odd years, if not more, uh, at the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club. And Yacht Club is not exactly the first, or yacht is not exactly what defines, but you've been more of a rower. And there's something very interesting you, you, you wrote, is that you started rowing to avoid <laughs> hockey and cross-country running. What was that all about? Well, that's true. I, uh, in the UK, um, I went to Kingston Grammar School, which was uh, probably the leading hockey school in the country. Mm -hmm. And for the first year, I played hockey and in the summer, cricket. But both these sports involve running, and I'm not very good at running. And also, when the uh, playing field was too wet as a result of rain, we were sent off to do cross-country running in Richmond Park which was even more unsuitable for me. So at the end of the first year at school, I switched to rowing, which had the advantage that they did it every term of the, of the year, throughout the whole year. So didn't have to do much running. So that was what, around 1952, something? Uh, I would have uh, started rowing in 1952. Then you came to Hong Kong, like 13 odd years later, 1965? I came to Hong Kong, I arrived in September <coughs> 1965 and very quickly discovered the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club and that the, the, the was rowing here. So I, I contacted the club and uh, the rowing captain at that time, Vic Ardy, uh, proposed me for membership and I was actually, I started rowing immediately, fortunately. January the 6th 1966 I was elected to the club. And everything has been meteoric since. I mean you, you, you arrived 65 September, three months later you're part of the club and immediately in 67 already you're rowing captain with some significant rowing achievements in also along the way. Well significant maybe yeah. or not but <laughs> when I arrived the rowing section were training for the <coughs> Far Eastern Amateur Rowing Association Championships, which were scheduled to be held in Manila in February uh, 66. So um, I became part of the team that was training, and uh, we trained uh, here at Kellett Island, actually. We, uh, we did interval training up and down the outer breakwater of the Typhoon Shelter. Um, I was able to help with the training because in the UK I'd been fortunate to have been uh, under the guidance of a, a very talented German uh, coach who was one of the first people to introduce interval training mm -hmm. to rowing. So we did interval training here in the Typhoon Shelter and when we went to Manila uh, the opposition wasn't very strong so we won everything. <laughs> a clean sweep so to speak. Yes. Sweepboard rowing and sculling as well, yes. <laughs> then 67, rowing captain. I mean, and, and at the same time, I think you went around the island and you beat a record? 1968, yes. Des Robinson and I rowed around Hong Kong Island. Fifteen years previously, uh, my, my proposer for membership, Vicardi, had uh, rowed round, not the, by any means the first person to have rowed round Hong mm. Kong Island. I mean, that started way, way back in the, in the previous century. There was a very easy time waiting to be beaten and we actually used the same boat that had been used 15 years previously, which was a, a clinker tub pair, which we believe had come to the Yacht Club together with all the other boats from Shanghai mm -hmm. Rowing Club when Shanghai Rowing Club had to close down in 1952. Wow. And uh, this was a very, very old boat and it leaked quite substantially. So we completed the row five hours, 30 minutes, uh, coxed by uh, the boat boy from Middle Island. It was... Uh, you were nearly sinking at the, by the end of it, no? Well, no, we weren't sinking, but the bow compartment was half full of water, 
Uh, so we, it was, there was too much water to lift the boat out, so we pushed the boat out into deeper water where we could turn it upside down and then gradually lift it and drain the water out of it. But then in 1973, when the laser class came about, you decided, oh, I'll give that a shot, right? And you started sailing. Yes, I did. <laughs> I started sailing. Um, I, I had by no means a distinguished sailing career. Um, I started sailing because I was in the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club. And um, Alan Stevens, who was a, a talented sailor and uh, used to compete in the Finn class, uh, decided to start the lasers and he, he imported a container load of lasers and they were for sale and I bought one and so I sailed a laser for about three years. I can only find one rec record of my name being mentioned <laughs> <laughs> and I found sailing very frustrating because I could not see why other people were going faster than me and I did a bit of crewing. I crewed for a little bit on uh, Ron McCauley's about Mamamuchi, yeah. um, but uh, then I went back to rowing. That's where you felt you belonged, you felt you had more to contribute and indeed you've contributed quite a lot over the years. But at the same time around 1974 I think you were you were given quite a quite a sizable task which was to redevelop Kettle Island. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Ah, the, the redevelopment here, yes. Mm. Well, I, what happened was I had been on the, as rowing captain, I'd been on general committee for four years, and when I stepped down as rowing captain, I continued to be on the general committee. And in 1974, the general committee, uh, under pressure from the membership, decided to, the, to do something about improving the club's facilities. So the decision had been taken to move the rear commodore, who normally chaired the house committee, to make the rear commodore the uh, chairman of a new committee called the, to be called the planning committee. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who, but somebody uh, suggested that I sh might stand for this position. So there were two of us uh, standing for election as the rear commodore, and I got in very narrowly. I was told afterwards by one of the uh, scrutineers, scrutineers yeah. that uh, they'd had three recounts. In, <laughs> That's quite something. Yeah. Do you remember who your, the other person was, who the opponent yes, was? Yes, it was Bill Jeffrey, a well-known sailor in the, in the club. So I was rather surprised that I got elected. Surprised because you were a rower? Yes. So you, you were saying also that in those times, there was, was there a bit of a cleavage between uh, rowing not, and not sailing? Not really, but the sailing side of the club was much, much bigger than the rowing side of the mm. club. And, um, you know, the sailors, all congregated in the main bar after re after racing, but the rowers are over at Middle Island, so they're a bit out of out of out, sight. Out of sight, yeah. And you said you said I think in the, the, the around seventy eight there were only like thirty odd rowers. Yes, now that's jumping ahead a little bit to uh -huh. when we came to form the rowing association. But the the story about the the development in the seventies is quite interesting because. Uh, uh, having been elected rear commodore, I was then asked to form the planning committee mm -hmm. and I recruited uh, five or six other Yacht Club members. Uh, Mike Burrell, who was treasurer, was one. Mark Dowling, who was honorary secretary, was another. Uh, David Thornborough, an architect. David Milner, Ken Gottfried. We, we formed the planning committee and we started meeting every Wednesday and our meetings usually lasted about six hours. And we had a wonderful lady, Dorothy Ballion, who took the minutes, and she produced the minutes of these meetings within 48 hours. Wow. Initially, the, 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 what we had to do was really take a close look at what we'd already got, what the existing structure of the club was, and mm. what additional facilities could be provided and, and could, be, uh, could be needed. Um, so at that time, uh, we put in the swimming pool, which I'll come back to later, uh, we built the workshop building, um, the bistro, the three barrel vaults there, the brick barrel vaults were converted into a bistro uh, with a snooker room and, and a kitchen in one of them. Mm -hmm. One of those uh, barrel vaults, the southern one, was where the contractor who repaired people's boats had his workshop. It was the boat yard workshop. workshop yeah, yeah, that's right. The other two barrel vaults were filled with uh, wooden wood 
wooden and uh, wire mesh cages yeah. where members kept their sailing equipment. And the whole place was filthy dirty. Interestingly, we, uh, when we cleared the whole area out and we had a contractor uh, doing that work, he came to us and he said, look, on either side of the barrel vaults there's a brick wall going from the floor up to the ceiling. And he said, I don't think this brick wall is doing anything. So we told him to remove the brick wall because that would widen each uh, barrel vault by uh, two brick widths. Mm -hmm. And then we found these interesting um, granite walls with all these holes in, which has been a permanent mystery yes. exactly what these holes but were you, for. But you, you, you surmise that probably they were used as well, the beams to... Yes. The, I mean, the original building here, if we go back way, way back into history, uh, at a certain point, uh, the, the government of Hong Kong decided to create a store, store here on Kelly Island for ammunition and explosives. So these barrel vaults were where ammunition and explosives were being stored. And I, I, my, my feeling is the holes in the granite walls uh, where they had the ends of beams which supported shelves on which th this uh, explosive material uh, could be stored. The swimming pool was another yes. interesting thing. It was quite divisive. There were a lot of people in the club who wanted to have a swimming pool. And uh, there were, on the other hand, there were those who did not want a swimming pool. They, they didn't want the club to become a club where swimming became a major activity. I have to say, this is in contrast to what had been happening many, many years before in the, in the history of the club. Because when the club was at Oil Street, it was operating off a very nice beach. And the members used to swim there a lot and enjoyed that. In fact, uh, in those days, the club used to enter a team in the Hong Kong Water Polo League. And in regattas, there were sometimes swimming races as well. But when the club moved to Kellett Island, it lost the beach. Right. So there was, if, in, in 1947, 1948, at the annual, annual general meeting, there was discussion about whether the club should build a swimming pool. Yeah. And the, the Commodore at that time... Uh, Noel Croucher? Noel Croucher. Uh, he and the committee, the general committee, were in favour of building a swimming pool to replace the swimming facility that they had lost yeah. at the previous clubhouse. Uh, but they couldn't afford it. The, the club still owed HSBC quite a lot of money for the development that had taken place before the war. I think the bill was around 50,000 Hong Kong dollars at the time for the swimming uh, pool. The bill, I think the bill... Just for the swimming pool? Yeah, I think it could have been a lot more than that, actually. Mm. I think it could have been in the region of $100,000 mm. to build a swimming pool. So no swimming pool was built in 1947-48. And then by May 1975, we had prepared a proposal which we presented to the General Committee and we asked the General Committee to approve our preliminary proposal. If they approved it, we would then go back to the drawing board and do more detailed work. So it was a very interesting meeting. Bill Blau, who was Commodore, was away. So the meeting was chaired by Brian Keep, Vice Commodore. And after we did our presentation, the General Committee voted on whether to approve our preliminary proposals. And the vote was 50-50, split, exactly equal. But then Brian Keep, chairman of the meeting, had a casting vote. So he cast his vote against our proposals. At that point, Mark Dowling, who was uh, the Honorary Secretary and a member of the Planning Committee, pointed out that Noel Croucher, who was at the meeting, and was a vice patron of the club, wasn't a member of the general committee and wasn't allowed to have a vote. So the vote was taken again, and this time the vote passed by one vote. By one vote. So after that we went back to the drawing board. October that year, October 1975, there was a big EGM with about 300 members here in the uh, what is now called the Compass Room. Uh, I. I introduced the plan, I spoke for about 45 minutes and then the members voted and we had five resolutions that needed to be passed and they were all passed with substantial majorities in the region of 85 to 90%. 90%, yeah. And then after that we got on with 
doing the, uh, the redevelopment. So this room we're sitting in now, the ward room, uh, this didn't exist at that before that time. This was just on the roof of uh, the bar down below. The gun room, the same, also didn't exist. Uh, so we created the ward room, we created the gun room. We had a very talented interior designer, David Crow, who unfortunately has passed away some years ago, who was very good with wood and metal. He did the, all the decor in the compass room. That room had no decoration at all. It was completely an empty shell. We created the compass room and with the ceiling in the shape of a marine compass. And the bistro? The bistro was called the bistro because I had a favourite restaurant in London, which was a bistro. So we, <laughs> we borrowed the, the bistro name for it. You know, when you, when you were saying that actually, you know, the, the, you had a meeting room which was somewhere in between this level and, and one downstairs. Yes, yes. Yeah. And there was no, yeah. the bathroom didn't exist. It, that's yeah. where the some I mean, stairs for, were. For those who know the club and know this floor that we're on now, through the wall there, where the, we have uh, men's and ladies' uh, toilets, that area actually is where the old committee room used to yeah. be, but it was down some steps, maybe about 10 or 12 steps down. And the only window of that room was a very high-level window that looked onto the terrace that eventually became the ward room where we are now. Mm -hmm. It was quite interesting to explore the club, go into all the corners and try to figure out what to do. So we, we created, in this building, we created the, the ward room, the gun room, the, the bistro, we did the compass room, uh, we built the workshop building, we built the travel lift. To relieve the uh, anxiety of those who didn't want to have a swimming pool, didn't provide a rectangular pool, we provided this pool which is two three, overlapping three circles four, yeah. or three overlapping circles. It is exactly <coughs> 25 metres long, so if anyone wants to... Oh, it is, because we've been wondering, we thought that it was slightly shorter than 25. Was no, it's exactly 25 metres long. And, oh, uh, so fantastic, yeah. so we'll be able to say, now you can do your <laughs> 25 metres. Then yeah. you were elected Commodore in 1978, 78 yes, to 1980, was, right? Yes, by 78 we had done everything that we had planned to do. There was one thing that we weren't able to provide. In the original proposal we had planned a tennis court, mm -hmm. but the parking requirement overshadowed that. And one thing I should mention is the funding of this yes. whole development programme. Because in 1974, when we were starting, the club had very little cash. The general reserve was 1,200,000 Hong Kong dollars, but the whole development that we did at that time cost about 7 million, and we had to raise all that money as well as decide what we were going to do. So that was quite a challenge. We had to not only to design, work out a, a proposal for enhancing the club's facilities, but we also had to figure out how to raise the money to pay for it all. It seems that um, the, the, the more we, we move ahead, the same problems we're facing. Because as a club, financial institutions are not going to lend us any money. So, yeah. so and a number of challenges. But certainly one thing that, that you and, and, and your team then have accomplished is, you know, an iconic part of the club, which is this level with an iconic compass room, which... Yes, um, we, uh, we had a, a lot of debate about what to do with this room that became the compass room mm. because it has to serve a number of different purposes. It has to be, uh, it was going to become the main dining right. room. Previously, the main dining room was down below, there was the chart room. Yeah. But this was, compass room was going to be the main dining room. It had to be okay for day-to-day -day meals, lunch, dinner and so on. It had to be okay for uh, big events, balls and so on. It had to be okay for annual general meetings and extraordinary general meetings, which is why eventually we settled on this uh, floor arrangement with three different levels of the floor. Mm. And, I, and, and I think you've certainly accomplished it because we have our EGMs and AGMs in that room and we have events and yeah. we have our fine dining, which, uh, yeah. you know, and, and it endures, it perdures, it's still very much a a core element of, yes. of, this, uh, of this club. Yes. I mean, the room has obviously been maintained and, and redecorated from time to time, but the, the essential configuration is just the same as it was yeah. uh, back in 1978.
No, no, I think very much so, and um, I think people very much appreciate it. And it is a unique location that we're. That it we're is, in, so. and also what makes Kellett Island still unique is that it, this has the last remaining bit of natural coastline in Hong Kong's harbour. That is true. So, so just going back, uh, I mean, I, I want to correct a, a, a misguided. Uh, impression is that you were the first rowing Commodore and when I, I, I believe that and I mentioned that to you you said no 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 that's not the case there's been quite a few before yeah there but were I think general law in, in the club is you are the first no I'm not I'm not and if you want a list of all the co previous Commodores who were rowers and I don't mean just occasional rowers I mean not rowers. Yeah. Serious rowers. Mm. There are a number of them. So uh, I'm, I'm very happy that we have now corrected that <laughs> <laughs> impression that a lot of us had and still have, I think. So it would be good to know who, who they were. Well, one name springs to mind immediately, which is Gray Dale, spelt D-A-L-Z-I-E-L. -E and he was Commodore of the club. Uh, and he was uh, very much involved with of, rowing. What sort of period? Which, which, which do you remember uh, the years? Before and after the Second World War. Right. And he uh, he had also been rowing captain, as well. So this question of commodores who have rowed, and the second classification would be rowing captains who became commodores yeah. as well. Yeah. Yes. Probably the latter. Yeah. So I'm by no means the, the first. You mentioned something to me which I think has defined quite a, a large chunk of, of your, your, your life was when you said sport is an enjoyable, must be an enjoyable social activity that brings people together to enhance their lives. And I think that has been something very much a guiding principle of yours which has caused you to be involved in the development of rowing in Hong Kong as we know it today. I mean, first and foremost, the, the setting up of an association. So you, we go back to those 30 rowers back yes. in 1978. Yes. May the 30th, 1978, we uh, incorporated the Hong Kong, what was then called the Hong Kong Amateur Rowing Association. Uh, later on, uh, after 1997, it changed its name to Hong Kong China Rowing Association because at, at the Olympic Games and in World Championships, Hong Kong competes as Hong Kong China. So we changed the name uh, accordingly. But in 1978, uh, I and some of the other rowers wanted to do something to promote rowing. In fact, it's required. The is a club objective to encourage rowing and sailing. Yeah. So it seemed to us that to really encourage rowing is, would be something that we needed to do outside the uh, walls of the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club. Because the Yacht Club today and then was a relatively expensive club to join and people who only wanted to row didn't need all the facilities at Kellett Island. So we decided to form a rowing association to develop the sport and uh, that, that was formed in, in May 1978 and uh, we, we had no money and we had no boats and it was also one of our principles that none of the founding members or future board members or council members would be required or encouraged to contribute anything to the association mm -hmm. other than their time and their expertise. Uh, so we thought if we, if we were offering something of value to the community the community would support us yeah. and uh, the first uh, thing that happened was that we obtained a grant from the Sir David Trench Fund which we used to buy a Coxed Four and yeah. oars and with the Yacht Club's help this boat was initially kept at Middle Island and was used to introduce rowing to Hong Kong University mm -hmm. students and others outside the club, non-members of the club. We started to organize rowing championships each year, initially at Middle Island, and then at, uh, uh, in the New Territories. And by 1981, uh, 
we published a development plan for rowing, yeah. uh, a comprehensive development plan for rowing. We sent it to everybody from the, the governor downwards, all the jockey club stewards, and uh, other, anyone in the government uh, or in the community who we thought could help us. Got a copy. Yeah, got a copy. Also, we sent it to anybody we thought could object to what we were trying to do because we wanted everyone to be on our side. Mm -hmm. And we got a lot of complimentary uh, uh, feedback. Uh, it, we got the impression that we, although we were a brand new sports association, that we seemed to have been the first sports association ever to write a development plan. That was issued in June 1981. 81, yeah. Okay, and then in September uh, we issued a, a proposal for a, for a, a, a rowing centre in Sha Tin. Yeah. We knew that Hong Kong, being a s small place uh, and land against the, on the waterfront, was in big demand for all sorts of purposes. So the the idea that we could create a lot of different rowing clubs was probably a non-starter in Hong Kong. So the theory was that we would create district rowing centres where schools, universities, clubs could keep their equipment and from which they could row. So the first proposal was to create a rowing centre in Sha Tin. That proposal was made in June 1981, uh, in September 1981. That's right. And within three or four months, the Jockey Club had agreed to fund it. Yeah. And the government had agreed to provide the land on which it is now standing. Initially, we got uh, an initial grant of $400,000 mm -hmm. from the government. This was money provided by the Jockey Club, which the government could use what, for whatever purpose it it decided. Yeah. So we got $400,000. With that, we put up a temporary shed at Sha Tin on the corner of the Fotan Nuller. And we started rowing in Sha Tin in May 1982. Then we were planning the, the, the big rowing centre, and that opened in November 1985. And we hosted the first Asian Rowing Championships. Uh, we'd been instrumental, uh, together with other countries, in forming the Asian Rowing Federation. But none of the other countries, China, Japan, Korea, India, none of them wanted to be the first to host the, the, first, first, the Asian first Rowing season, Championships. Yeah. So we said, okay, well, you can all come here. So we organized the first Asian Rowing Championships at Shanghai. This Shanti. is quite phenomenal when you say for, from that, that vision that rowing had in 1981 and that by 1985 you were hosting the first Asian rowing competition. I mean, it's, it's quite meteoric again as uh, and it shows a purpose and an energy yeah which sometimes a lot of sailors look at rose and say, how do they do that yes i know um when i was commodore uh i sat on the uh, I, I sat for two years on the council of the uh, yachting association and i have to say one thing i noticed was that they never talked about development they only talked about administering what was already there. And I think that is true of a lot of sports associations in Hong Kong and maybe elsewhere in the world as well. It's so easy, if you're the governing body, to just be focused on the day-to-day, month-to-month, year-to-year needs of administering the sport. Within the rowing association, one of the things that we wanted to do was to have somebody concentrating on development. So I said, look, I'll step aside as president and I won't chair the board meetings anymore. I will have a little committee which looks at development. And after that, we were able to create the second rowing centre at Sha Tin, the Shek Mun Rowing Centre. Mm -hmm. But I think to develop sport, you need to have some people who are administering the sport and you need to have a completely separate group of people who are focused on developing the sport, which is something else entirely different. Yeah. But that energy that you have for developing rowing, then that in itself also attracted the interest from other sports. Uh, I had drafted the Memorandum and Articles of Association of the Rowing Association, and w we were one of the few associations that was incorporated under the company's ordinance. But then pressure came on sports associations to become registered under the company's ordinance. So a number of sports associations asked me for help you know, on how to draft the, the constitution. And also how to have a 
sports association which uh, can avoid political infighting among, 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 among the members. This is something you came across with the dragon boats, I think, is, is well, quite emblematic of yes, that infighting. I know. In it. We formed the rowing association in May 1978, and in that year, the tourist association were holding their third edition of Hong Kong's international dragon boat races. This is an interesting story in its own, because the, the tourist association executive director was a fellow called John Payne and he in 1976 invited a crew from Nagasaki to come to Shaoki Wan and compete against nine Hong Kong fishermen's crews which and Nagasaki came and they did very well. The following year again in Shaoki Wan uh, there was Nagasaki and this time Penang came as well. The Tourist Association were trying to find a way to increase tourism in the summer, which was a slack period in Hong Kong for tourism. By 1978, they had moved the races to East Chim Sa Chui. Now the races were being managed by one of the fishermen's associations. And in the grand final, a crew from Sai Kung collided with the Nagasaki crew, effectively putting both of those crews out of the race, much to the dismay of the 300 Japanese supporters who had come with the Nagasaki crew. This resulted in a, a little bit of an altercation, or you might call it a fight, uh, which was quickly damped down. But then the Saikon crew had a conflict with the Aberdeen crew, which had gone on and were the winners. So this was all going out live on television all over Asia and not very good for Hong Kong. So there were editorials in the newspapers and uh, this must never happen again. Uh, and uh, so I looked at this and I said, I thought, well, there's an opportunity here. We had just formed the rowing association, but we had no recognition. We had no credibility. Nobody knew anything about rowing. If you talk to ordinary people in the, in the street about rowing, they thought you meant dragon boat paddling or maybe canoeing. Mm. They were unaware of rowing as a sport. So. I went to the Tourist Association and I said, look, we are the Rowing Association. I said, we've just been formed. Dragon boat paddling, dragon boat racing is not our sport, but we know how to organize boat races. Would you like us to help? And they accepted our invitation. So for the next 18 years, the <laughs> in, in Hong Kong's international dragon boat races were actually run by the Rowing Association. We worked out how to keep the boats level at the start. We trained officials. I wrote the racing rules. We put photo finish equipment at the finish. And as I said, for 18 years, we ran the international dragon boat races for the tourist association. We, didn't, we weren't paid for doing it. We did it because it was a, a fun thing to do. But we treated, we treated it as a serious sport. And I think this, this also helped then to export dragon boat racing around the world the UK, many European countries, Australia, New Zealand, United States, Canada, uh, South Africa, uh, all started doing dragon boating. By uh, 1990, national associations in some of these countries were already in existence, mm -hmm. and the, there appeared to be a need for an international federation. So I was asked to bring that into existence, uh, and the reason they picked on me was because before each of the Hong Kong international races, I, I was the race controller. I used to brief the representatives of the overseas teams. And after the uh, races in Hong Kong, we would have another meeting where we would discuss how the, how the event had gone and whether they had any suggestions that we could adopt for improving how we managed it the following year. So I was quite well known. So at one of these meetings, I was asked to form a committee and uh, draft a constitution for, the, for an international federation. So I did that, and in 1991, after the Hong Kong races, I chaired a meeting which uh, led to the uh, formation of the International Dragon Boat Federation. And during the meeting, of course, we had to elect the council and officers. <laughs> and what happened? <laughs> well, it's okay. To cut a long story short, I was elected president, and I hadn't planned to be president of the IDBF. So I was president for three years, and then I st stood down. And uh, because 
much as I enjoyed the involvement with dragon boating, it was not my primary sporting interest. And my primary sporting interest was rowing, and by that time also the development of sport in general in Hong Kong. You seem to never stop. You were probably Back the in, godfather <laughs> of Well, you know, things are out of control. Of sports, yes, <laughs> completely. One thing leads to another. So the forming the Rowing Association led to our involvement, not just me, but a, a lot of other people from the Rowing Association becoming involved with promoting dragon boat racing. And because the Rowing Association also at Sha Tin was considered by the government to be doing a reasonably good job, uh, there came a point where I was asked to go on to an advisory body called the Council for Recreation and Sport. So I went on to the council and now I had a responsibility for thinking about sp sport development in general in Hong Kong. Not just rowing and not dragon boating but sport in general. And <clears throat> my conclusion after being on the council for a year was that the machinery for developing sport in Hong Kong was ineffective. So I wrote a letter to the chief secretary. Uh, the letter was five pages long and 14 pages of appendices, analyzing all the problems with how sport was organized in Hong Kong. And uh, this attracted some at attention at the level of the government. So uh, the government uh, eventually uh, appointed a consultant from the UK to come here, Emlyn Jones. I had suggested they appoint John Wheatley, who was then the executive director of the UK Sports Council, but he, w he wasn't available. Emlyn Jones had been his predecessor and was retired from the Sports Council but running his own sports consultancy business. Yeah. So Emlyn came to Hong Kong, he interviewed more than a hundred people, he wrote a report called The Way Ahead, which basically endorsed what I had recommended, mm -hmm. and so uh, by 89, a provisional sports development board was set up. By April the following year, the legislation had been passed to establish the Hong Kong Sports Development Board. And, you know, I was made a member of the Hong Kong Sports Development Board. Uh, I served on that for six years. Mm -hmm. And then the, the government had a rule that you shouldn't be on anything for more than six, six years. Six years, that's right, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I was off that. Along, somewhere along the way, I was also made a board member of the Hong Kong uh, Sports, Sports Institute. Institute, yeah. Institute, yeah. And yeah. That's right. So, as a result of the of Emlyn Jones report, the government set up the Hong Kong Sports Development Board. Uh, but unfortunately, they, they got it slightly wrong because they left the control of all the public <coughs> sports facilities in the hands of the urban and regional councils, which I think was a big mistake. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there was uh, there was opposition, uh, partly within the government and partly uh, from uh, the Amateur Sports Federation and Olympic Committee. Uh, there was uh, criticism of the Sports Development Board, which eventually uh, led to the government firstly merging the Sports Institute with the Sports Development Board and then abolishing the whole thing and creating a new structure, which is what we have today. It's not the way I would have done it, but... <laughs> One of the, the elements you mentioned in, in, in part of your, your philosophy and your, your outlook on sports is that you, you say that major sports clubs like ours yes. have a social responsibility to develop sport within the wider community. Yes, I think sport is enormously important for social reasons. Mm -hmm. I regard sport as a social activity. I don't agree with people who think that sport is something you should do because it's good for you. And I don't agree with people who think that sport's only purpose is to win gold medals at the Olympic Games and show what a good uh, government uh, you, you have. Yeah. You know, for me, sport is something that is for the people, for ordinary people to take part in. And the more people can take part in sport, the better. So. I, I judge the success of any sports uh, development program not by how many medals uh, is won, although that is also important it's an because important winning, metric, but it winning medals be encourages yeah. ordinary people to take part in sport. But it shouldn't be the be all and end all of it. I, I'm much more keen to have a big increase in the number of people who take part in sport for social reasons because they enjoy it, 
they enjoy the activity, they enjoy doing it with other like-minded individuals, they enjoy competing against like-minded individuals as well. And this, I think, is something that the government, when we talk about the government, of course, when the government is just a collection of people, and so I think some of the people who have responsibility for sport don't fully understand the social benefits that sport has. Yeah, it builds the social fabric. I mean, it's uh, very important. But I think they did recognize what you have done because I think in 2013, you, you, you got some, some form of uh, recognition from the government? Yes, I got a Medal of Honor for contributions to sports development. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, some, somewhere, somehow, they did listen. Well, I think that the, the development of sport in Hong Kong is just at the beginning. You know, it's, it, it is, has not progressed uh, uh, as rapidly or to the extent that I would have liked to have seen. Mm. And I can say that both for the rowing association and for many other sports as well. I, I think that uh, a lot more could have been done and a lot more should be done in the future. But whether we can attract the interest of our new uh, chief executive, John Lee, uh, whether we can persuade the government to be more proactive in providing sports facilities, uh, I don't know. We will have to see. We will have to see indeed. Thank you very much, Bob. That was a great pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for asking me.